Let's start. And I called this warm up because in theory we can handle this already. It says this. By the way, we're going to be doing a lot of uh, marble or donut questions the same way in the last unit we did a lot of words because it's fairly easy to morph these questions into more useful ones. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of card questions because, again, it's fairly easy to morph a card question into a more useful question as well. So box A contains three chocolate and five vanilla donuts. Box B <laughs> contains six chocolate and six vanilla donuts. A box is chosen at random, and a donut is selected and removed. It's chocolate. A second donut is then removed from the same box. What's the probability that it's also chocolate? How many boxes? Probably a job for a tree. Okay? And I think there's three things, Brooke, going on here. Choose a box. That's going to be one level of my tree. Choose the first donut, that's the second level of my tree. <laughs> Choose the second donut, that's the third level of my tree. <coughs> I hopefully left you lots of room. We're going to do a nice big tree. It's going to go like this. Box A, box B. What's the probability of picking box A at random? How many boxes are there? You know what? Now, the other thing I'll do sometimes, by the way, I like this question, I like this question, I like this question. The other thing I'll do sometimes to make it more interesting is I'll say instead of choosing the box at random, uh, roll a dice. If you get a one or a two, pick box one. If you get a three, four, five, or a six, pick box, pick box two, which would mean two out of six and four out of six on the branches. Or pick a card. If it's a club, pick box one. If it's not, pick bot, which would mean uh, one out of four, three out of four, one suit versus three suit. I, I can, there doesn't always have to be one half and one half, but for now, start out this way. Let's uh, see if we can finish box A. So when we get to box A, what are the possibilities? Chocolate, vanilla. Let's call it chocolate one, vanilla one. First donut. How many chocolate donuts are there in box A? Three out of? How many vanilla donuts are there in box A? Five out of eight. Let's keep going. Now, we're going to pick a second donut. Could be chocolate. Vanilla, chocolate, vanilla. Right? Down this branch here, down this branch here, we already picked a chocolate donut. How many chocolate donuts are left in box A? Two out of? Two out of seven. How many vanillas are left? Five out of seven. Right? Down this branch, we picked a vanilla from box A. How many chocolates are left then? Three out of seven. And four out of seven. Now, once you've written that down, look up. Some built-in error checks. By the way, you have to be able to draw a tree on your own. If you can't do this, you need to be coming in for help like crazy because this is going to be fundamental for the rest of the unit. If you can't, if you're saying, how the heck is he getting this? We need to practice this. Built-in error checks. Rachel, do those add to one? Yeah. We didn't miss anything. Do those add to one? Do those add to one? Do those, we got our built-in error checks. Also, Rachel, do you notice down this branch, that number is different than that number. C2 and C2 are different. That tells you these are dependent, not independent. Right? Let's go fill in B. Is that a hand up? No? OK. Chocolate one. I'm going to move way over here so I have more room. Vanilla one. How many chocolates does box B have? 
Six out of? And six out of 12 vanillas. Then we have chocolate two, vanilla two, chocolate two, vanilla two. Uh, down this branch here, we picked a chocolate. Yes, I'm getting hungry. I shouldn't have done this lesson right before lunch. Anyways, uh, how many chocolates are left? Five out of 11. Six vanillas out of 11. Down the other branch, we picked a vanilla. So there's six chocolate out of 11 and five vanillas out of 11. Again, Rosanna, my built-in error check, all these branches add to one. I see 11 out of 11. All these branches add to one. I see 11 out of 11. Also, again, the fact that C2 and C2 down the B branch are different tells you they are, uh, oh, dependent events. All right, we got our treat. We picked a box. We picked a donut. We picked another donut. This is about as big as a tree as I'll ever do. How many levels does this tree have? Three. This is kind of my teetering point, my cutoff point. I will almost never do a four level tree. It gets way too wide. All right. Kayvon, can you read to me starting with the sentence, a box is chosen? Box is chosen at random. Check. Oh, donut. Oh. Yeah, keep going. Uh, it is chocolate. Okay. A second donut is then removed from the same box. Yep. Uh, what is the probability that it is also chocolate? Which branch or branches satisfy that? Let's walk down. Does this branch satisfy that statement? Yeah? You know what? Let's put a little check mark underneath there. Does this branch satisfy it? Nope. How about this branch? How about this branch? How about this branch? In fact, I think those are the only two branches that satisfy it is chocolate, a second donut is removed, what's the probability that it's also chocolate? Those are the only two branches. Multiply down, add across is what we're going to do. Now, I want to show you how we would write this in probability notation. We would say this. What this question is asking us to find is, the probability of the second one is chocolate, given that the first one is chocolate. Because that's another way, a shorter way, I could write this. Instead of saying, uh, it is chocolate, a second donut is then removed from the same box, I could say, find the probability of C2 given C1. And certainly that way shorter. which is going to be <coughs> walk down this branch, multiply down a half times three-eighths times two-sevenths. Or, because you can walk down this branch, Christina, or you can walk down this branch. What does or mean? That's why there's a plus sign. 1 half, 6 twelfths, 5 elevenths. As a fraction, what's the answer? Now you want to start getting familiar with the wonderfully convenient fraction functions of these fancy schmancy calculators. It's going to be 1 fraction 2 times 3 fraction 8 times 2 fraction 7 plus. 1 fraction 2 times 6 fraction 12 times 5 fraction 11. What's the probability? Basically, what this is saying is, hey, if you have this setup, if you have two boxes and you're picking two donuts from the same box, what are the odds of getting two chocolates? Do you get 103 out of 660? As a decimal, 
you got about a 16.7% chance. Not great odds of getting two chocolates. 103. Or 16.7 percent. I didn't say whether I wanted the answer as a percentage or as a fraction or so I'll do both. By the way, what if I gave you the same setup, Rosanna, but I said, what's the problem that you get one chocolate and one vanilla? Why, that would be this branch, or this branch, or this branch, or this branch. Multiply down, add across. It'd be more work. I could do it. This is what I'm trying to get across to you, Caitlin, is setting up a good tree, the question tends to fall apart. But if you're having trouble setting up the trees, you're in a little trouble. What we're going to ask ourselves today is this. What if instead of going down the tree, what if instead I tell you what happened here and I want to know what's the probability that you came down this branch and not that branch? What we're going to ask ourselves today is what if you want to go up the tree and find out what's the probability that I picked a certain branch? And it turns out that opens up some very cool questions some very counterintuitive questions. And we call that conditional probability, the title of today's lesson. Okay, next one. Bag A contains five yellow and five green marbles. Bag B contains seven yellow and two green marbles. A card is randomly drawn from a deck of cards if it's a club the marble is selected from bag A. Otherwise, a marble is selected from bag B. What's the probability that the marble is green? What's the probability that the marble is yellow? OK. Um, looks like we're picking a bag, and we're picking a marble. Wait a minute, Mr. Dick. Aren't we also picking a club? I think we can fit that into our tree. I think there's two things. Pick a bag, pick a marble. It's going to be a two-level tree. It's going to go like this. Bag A, bag B. <clears throat> What's the probability of picking bag A? It's not 50-50. It's not one half, one half this time. Because it says, before you do that, to choose what bag, what are we doing? Pick a club. So what's the probability of getting bag A? What's the probability of getting a club? And I guess three-fourths. Because there's four suits in a deck of cards, only one of which is clubs. Is that OK? Then what? Well, it looks like bag A contains yellow, green. It looks like bag B contains yellow, green. Once you're in bag A, what's the probability of getting a yellow? 5 out of 10, which I know is 1 half, but I, I find that 5 out of 10 relates much better to the numbers I see in the question, so I tend not to reduce uh, 5 out of 10. 7 out of what? 9? 2 out of 9. What's A want us to find? Probability. Now, I find the trees much more useful, but I'm trying to also then, Ellen, show you the notation. So they would say, find the probability of G, of green. Really, what they're saying is this. It's the probability that your bag A and green, or the probability that your bag B and green. I might not normally write that, Seb, but just to let you know if they gave it to you in probability notation. What does or mean? See, again, 
Silica, I find it much easier to say, hey, the two branches that I want are those to multiply down, add across. But can you see that's what this is saying? Multiply down or add, multiply down. It's going to be what? Uh, bag A, 5 tenths, or bag B, Two ninths. Which is what? Give it to me both as a fraction and give it to me as a percentage. This is also my way of saying, please make sure you know how to use the fraction button on your calculators. It's also my way of saying, please make sure you're bringing your calculators. Uh, let's see, it's going to be one fraction four times. 5 fraction 10, or 3 fraction 4 times 2 fraction 9. 7 out of 24? Mm -hmm. Or, and again, to go to a decimal right next to it, F to D is fraction to decimal. Uh, twenty nine point two percent. If this was a gambling game, would you play it? Why? This is not fair, right? Fair is when the well, fair is fifty when the odds are fifty percent. Better than fair in your favor is when the odds are above fifty one. So hopefully I'm also teaching you how you can figure out whether it's worth gambling or not. We'll start doing card questions later. But. And the answer is it's almost never worth gambling. Hey, what's B asking me to find? Marble's yellow? OK. Really, what that means is go down branch A and end at a yellow, or go down branch B and end at a yellow. I find it much easier to look at the tree. I think yellow is going to be 1 quarter, 5 tenths, or 3 quarters, 7 ninths. You get 17 out of 24? <coughs> How could I have figured that out without actually doing this? Uh, there's a fancy word for opposite. begins with letter C. Okay, it's the complement. You either get a yellow or a green. There's no other possibilities. So if I was really clever, what I could have said is, well, if the probability of getting a green is 7 out of 24, uh, 17 out of 24, whatever's left must be here. But I think you also get that when you crunch the numbers too, yes? Or what's it going to be, 70.8%? 70 point? 70 point, shouldn't be. 17 fraction, no, clear. Is it 17, do you guys get 17 out of 24 when you crunch the numbers or not? Yeah, and then it should be 70.8, yeah. If this was a game, would you play this? In fact, as soon as the odds are more than 50%, bet everything. You may lose sometimes, but the longer you play it, the more that law of large numbers will start to say that you'll win more often than you'll lose. But as soon as the odds are 49.99999%, the more you play, the more it is guaranteed that you're going to lose. So as the odds are anywhere less below 50%. The longer you play, the more certain it is that you'll revert to that law of large numbers and you'll end up losing all your money. Kind of puts the card tricks into perspective. I told you, but I'll say it again. I've been to Las Vegas a few times. Oh, I swear, Las Vegas is a tax on people who suck at math because there are some people there and I listen to them talking while they're at the slot machines or while they're at the card tables and they, oh. 
Doesn't mean don't gamble. It means if you're gambling, understand you're paying $100 for an hour of fun because you're going to lose it all. Because there are no fair games in Las Vegas, none. Okay. Now, I said to you, so those two questions in theory, review, in theory. I said to you, though, what we're going to look at is going backwards up the tree. Now it's going to start. Example one. A pot is randomly selected, and then a bill is randomly chosen from that pot. You know what? Since we're choosing two things, a pot and then a bill, that's a job for a tree. In fact, I gave you a spot to draw the probability tree diagram right here. So we can go pot one, pot two. Really, Rachel? Is that a mirror or a phone? Okay. Okay, because I was going to say, you're not being very secretive about... Okay. You're back? I know. Hey, uh, what's the probability of getting pot one? Does it give me any kind of a, like, pick a card or, or roll a dice or anything? No. So what's the probability of picking pot one and pot two? What's going to go on these two branches here? Half and half, yep. By the way, this is called a weighted probability tree. You're drawing a tree and you're weighting the branches with different fractions. All right, what are the possibilities in pot one? I can get a zero, a 10, or a 20. What are the possibilities in pot two? I can get a zero, a 10, or a 20. In pot one, what's the probability of getting a zero? One out of three. In fact, I think it's one out of three, one out of three, and one out of three. What are my branches going to look like for pot two? One out of four, two out of four, one out of four. I've got my tree. Now, let's go back and answer all the questions. It says this. What's the probability that a $10 bill is chosen if you know that it came from pot one? If I was writing that in our notation, it's really saying this. What's the probability pot one and 10? Can you see the branch? Which branch are we talking about? Boom, boom this one. Yes, and only this one. How am I going to calculate that? A half times a third. I'm going to argue this one we don't need a calculator for. Top times top, bottom times bottom. What do we get? One sixth. Okay. If you know you picked pot one, the odds of you getting a $10 bill, one in six times. What's the probability that a $10 bill is chosen if it's known that pot two is the selected pot? So we're saying this, probability Well, you're in pot two. Two out of eight? Okay. What if I just said, what's the probability that a $10 bill is chosen? Well, that says do any branch that ends in a 10. What that means is this. Probability of a $10 bill That means this branch or this branch, right? It means one half, one third, or one half, two quarters, which is what? As a fraction, please.
What do you get? Five twelfths. Now, here's the key to today's lesson. Now we're going to start to go backwards. This next question, instead of saying, I'm going to tell you which pot we're in, tell me what probability of the bill. Now I'm telling you D. Suppose I tell you that you got a $10 bill. Suppose I tell you which bottom branches we're in. What's the probability that it came from pot one? What are the odds that we came down this branch and not that one? Can you see we're going backwards up the tree? I'm telling you the bottom event, and I'm saying, now figure out which branch we must have come down. The probability of a certain branch. Now, there's going to be a trigger word that I'm going to use. So can all of you, where it says D, draw a little arrow pointing to the word if. And the word that I'm going to use whenever possible is the word given that. That's going to be your trigger that it's a conditional probability question. And I wrote here, begin by translating this question as a conditional probability. Here's how we would write this, and you're going to have to know how to write this. This is the one time when I'm going to be going to the formula because the formula works best. To write this, you would say this, the probability of What do they want me to find in part D? What do they want me to find? That it came from what? Pot one. What do I know? What did they tell me that we got? Given that, we got a 10. what I want to find given what I know. That's how you're going to write it. And if you can write it that way, then we're actually going to go to our formula. Now, what's our formula? You want to look at your pink formula sheet, please? On the pink formula sheet, you have this. Probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A. What number is that one? That's number seven? Is it? No? Yes? Yeah. yeah? Yeah. Okay. Get that by itself. How? I need to move this thing over. How? physics students, what's happening between the probability of A and the probability of B given A? What's happening right here? Timesing, so how will I move it over? This is the conditional probability formula. I'm going to give it to you as a formula, but we're going to memorize it in English, because in English it's easier. As a formula, it's this. The probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. See how that kind of pops out of there? I know. But I still never use that version. I'm going to give you an English version that works better. Okay. When I first taught this to my old math 12s, I just used the formula and they found it confusing. When I translated it to English, they found it way better. Here's what it means in English, and you want to write this down. If you ever want to find the probability of something given another thing, that's equal to the probability of both and See the word and right there? Divided by the probability of the given thing. That may sound confusing. It's not. Trust me. In fact, we're going to use it to answer this question here. OK? So Brooke, although the formula says this, what I really remember is if I see that given bar right there, it's going to be 
and on top, and means multiply, divided by the given one, that second one. Let's do this. The probability that it came from pot one, given that you got a $10 bill. That's going to be the probability of one and a $10 bill divided by the probability of $10 bill. It's going to be the probability of both and divided by the given one. This is called Bayes' theorem or Bayes' law. Actually, it's a modified version of Bayes' law. I should be fussy. And if we can get that, Rachel, then it's fairly plug and chug. I'll show you what I mean. Probability that we get a $10 bill. Um, <clears throat> didn't we just calculate it right here? Don't I have P of 10? <coughs> What's the probability we got a $10 bill? What over what? Oh. Probability of one and a $10 bill. Uh, didn't I kind of just calculate it right here? Hey, have you got a fancy schmancy fraction button? By the way, to divide by a fraction, it's flip it and multiply. But since we're using our technology, heck, 1 sixth divided by 5 fraction twelfth. What's the answer? 2 fifths. If you got a $10 bill, there's a 2 out of 5 chance that it came from pot A. There's a 3 in 5 chance that it came from pot B. That's going backwards up the tree. How do I do conditional probability? There's a trigger word, Rosanna. It's the word given. And if they give me a given that question, it's going to be the probability of both divided by the probability of the thing that they gave me, the thing that they told me, the thing that I know, not the thing that I'm trying to find out. Next page. So back in the 1960s, there was an American mathematician who was doing work with Bayes' law, with conditional probability, and also with z-scores and sampling. Some of the stuff that you did last year in Foundations 11. Remember the z-scores and the normal distribution and all that? And uh, he went to the American car companies. He went to GM. He went to Ford. He went to American Motors. He said, look, I can get you to find defects coming off of the factory floor better mathematically. You don't have to change your workers. You don't have to change anything. I can help you catch problems better. And the American car companies weren't interested. Nah, forget it, they said. So he went to Japan. He went to Toyota. He went to Honda. He went to what was then Datsun, which is now Nissan. And he said, look, I can teach you mathematical sampling methods and conditional probability so that you can track defects better you can get rid of more defects in your cars as they come off the assembly line, not by changing anything, by catching more of them. And they listened. And in the 1970s, and then the 1980s, and the 1990s, and even to this day, Japanese cars are better made than American cars because they catch more things. American cars have slowly, only in about the past 10 years or so, started to clue in. They're getting hammered. This is some of the math simplified that he brought. Here's an example. Instead of cars, I made computer chips. Suppose a company has two factories that make computer chips. How many factories? Two. 70% of the chips come from factory one. I guess it's a bigger factory. 30% of the chips come from factory two. And we've done random surveys. We know that in factory one on the assembly line, 25% of the chips are defective. Okay. In factory two on the assembly line, only 10% of the chips are defective. I guess because they're a smaller factory, they, you know, less goes wrong. Okay? We're going to ask two questions. 
First of all, suppose you buy a chip, you don't know what factory it came from, what's the probability that it's defective? But then we're going to ask the more interesting management question. Suppose management picks a chip, chip from their stock and it's defective. What's the probability that it came from factory one? That's a much more interesting question if you're doing industry. Okay? We're going to solve it using a tree. First thing we have to do is pick a factory. Factory A, or oh, sorry, I called it factory one. Factory two. Hey, what's the probability that a chip comes from factory one? I'm going to go 0.7. 7 out of 10, yeah, but 0.7. 70% as a decimal. Hey, what's the probability that it comes from factory two? 0.3. And then you can either be defective or not. What would be a good letter to use for defective? So you can be D or, remember our abbreviation for not D, that horizontal bar? D, not D. If you're in factory one, what's the probability that the chip is defective? 0.25. And logically, what's the probability that it's not defective then? 0.75, because they got to add to 1. Hey, if you're in factory 2, what's the probability that your chip is defective? And 0.9. There's my tree. Now, A says, suppose you don't know which factory you came from. You're going down the tree. What's the probability that you're defective? In other words, that branch or that branch. Yes? Probability of defective is going to be multiply down, add across. It's going to be 0.7 times 0.25 or 0.3 times 0.1. Now that's something a factory would, you know, a company would want to know. They'd want to know in stores what's the probability that a customer gets a defective chip because this is how you would, uh, you know, set up your warranties because you don't want to go broke. What do you get? What do you get? You need to type this into your calculator, folks. What do you get? And you need to stop making me tell you to type this into your calculator. I'm not going to do this for you. Colin, what'd you get? 205? Or 20.5%. So about one in five chips, because one in five is 20%. So a little more than one in five chips will be defective. That's pretty bad already. I, by the way, I made these numbers up just to make them nice, right? In real life, hopefully you'd have those percentages way lower. But let's suppose then you find a defective chip and you're trying to work your way back up the assembly line to see where the mistakes are happening. And this is what the mathematician pitched to the Japanese car companies. B says, all right, suppose you find a defect. What's the probability that came from factory one? Now, suppose a synonym for that is given. Hey, given that a defective chip is discovered, what's the probability that it came from factory one? So the three words that I'm going to use, I will almost always try and use the word given, but suppose or if are the synonyms. Here's what it's saying. Find the probability. What do we know? What's the given? What have they told me? No, no. What have they told me? What's the given? Given that it's defective, what do they want me to find? Factory 1. And do you notice factory 1 is up a level? That also is what tells you this is a conditional probability. We're going backwards up the tree. Now you can go all fancy, but I'm telling you what this is going to be is both over the given one. That's how the formula works. It's both over the given one. 
Oh, and by the way, conveniently, I think we already know P of D. Didn't we just figure that out in part A? <coughs> Isn't it 0. 0.205? Oh, and conveniently, I think I can find 1 and D. That's just this branch here, is it not? Multiply down. Isn't it just going to be 0 0.7, 0 0.25? What do you get? And the reason I like this, Justin, is the answers that appear don't show up anywhere in the original data. They're nice counterintuitive answers. So I get uh, 85.3, uh, 0.8536. Oh, I don't see that number showing up anywhere in the original question. But apparently, if I find a defective chip, there's an 85.3, sorry, 0.4% chance that it came from factory one. Not a 70% chance, which a lot of people would say because factory one makes 70% of the chips. It's higher than that. 0 0.854. 0 0.854 or... Better finish the lesson four homework for Friday. I'll be collecting it Friday and I'll be grumpy sending out emails on the weekend if you don't have it done for them.